There's a mistake. Moonlight, you guys won best picture. You like me right now. You like me. Ever since I was a little kid, I wanted this. Mom, I just want an Oscar. I'm Connor Wold, and welcome back to another episode of the Ultimate Oscar Showdown. And this week we are going to be continuing our look at the supporting actress category by tier ranking the winners from the 1990s. But if you guys are new to the series, what I've been doing all the way back since March have been tier ranking Oscar winners from certain categories. We've looked at Best Picture, Best Lead Actress, Best Lead Actor, now Best Supporting Actor, now we're in Best Supporting Actress, and we essentially look each decade, decade to decade, and tier rank the winners from S tier being the highest to D tier being the lowest. You guys have been showing a lot of support on, on this channel and this series, which I really appreciate. So please do comment below. Let me know your tier rankings, personal tier rankings. If you've seen these movies, if you haven't seen all these movies, that's fine too. Just tier rank the ones that you have seen and just let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. I really love to hear them, so please do continue doing that. But we are now at this part of the season where we got a couple more episodes. We've got 90s this week. We have 80s and 70s uh, the next two weeks, and then there's going to be no breaks. We're going to go right into the old Oscar countdown, starting off with um, you know some understanding uh, of the Oscar race before we get into you know best picture predictions and actress predictions and and lots of fun stuff uh, as per usual for that series. So you know subscribe to the channel so right now so you don't miss the, those videos and, and, and can stay up to date with them. Or if you enjoy this series and have been enjoying this series, please do continue and showing your support and checking out the Awards Oscar Countdown series in which I predict the Oscars. That's a lot of fun too, so I hope you stick around if you've been enjoying these videos. But without further ado, let's jump into things, starting off with the 1990 winner, Whoopi Goldberg in Ghost. And this is a great Whoopi Goldberg performance. She's really one of my favorite, best supporting performers in all of movies. You know, she has done well in big lead roles, but for me, she always works well in these sort of smaller spurts. You always want her in that sort of middle area where you always want more of her, but you don't necessarily want her to be the main lead. That's not that she's bad and sister act or whatnot but for me my favorite performances of her are in these sort of supporting roles she really adds a nice little bit of flavor a nice little bit of energy to movies and particularly in this film she's plays an integral character because she's so important to the overall story of the film because patrick swayze's character sam if she didn't really if he didn't really communicate with anybody he'd be moping around and be sort of boring and lame She's the one that really allows us to connect with the character and help move and progress that story along. So she's really integral in that regard. And Whoopi sort of nails it, uh, uh, knocks it out of the park. Uh, she has this great mix of amazement and exasperation when she finds out the fact that she can talk to ghosts. Of course, she's amazed that she can actually do it, but then quickly learns how annoying this is. And she's got these such great grand facial express expressions. She's very expressive in the movie and uses that for comedic effect. She's very funny in the movie but she's also got a real strong good nature and good sort of heart to her we like sam swayze's character place a lot of trust in this woman and her performance is she has to be sort of good natured and good hearted and she really i think captures that element of she may be exasperated she may be annoyed at some of the stuff she has to do but you know at the end of the day her heart's in the right place she'll do the right thing uh, she'll hand over the check to the nuns even if she'll be a little funny with it and, and not want to and, and have this great sort of physical humor uh, and physical comedy moment there's a great sort of element there too i think adds to the heart of the movie so not only is she sort of the, the adds a lot of the humor she adds a lot of the heart so she's a real big reason why the movie is successful but still you know a, a supporting player within the movie and really supporting that main relationship by allowing them to be super dramatic and serious so, but she can be so funny and engaging to keep the story along and keep your interest so she plays this perfect sort of uh, role within the movie and, and knocks it out of the park completely really really love Whoopi in this movie so she will go into the s tier then the 1991 winner is Mercedes Rule for The Fisher King. And she was really peaked at this moment, you know, being in movies like Big and Married to the Bob before this, and then this movie. You know, for that sort of period there in the late 80s, early 90s, she was sort of the go-to for the ethnic white person, sort of could be Italian, could be Jewish, um, sort of un un undescriptive in that regard. And when we talk about uh, 
characters within this series. We often mention great, well-written characters that ultimately probably win the Oscar more so than a great performance because of how their character ends up. But very rarely do we see sort of poorly written characters that have a truly great performance that elevate that uh, uh, written character. And I think that's this case here. You know, for, as this character is written on the screen, she is sort of a supporting wife, nagging wife, kind of a stereotype. And we don't love these characters for a lot of the times because we have our sort of two main heroes and their storyline and their focus. And oftentimes these supporting roles kind of pull our characters away into these side stories. And as an audience member, most of the time we don't like it because we want to focus on that main track, that main storyline. But Mercedes rule here, what she does is take the supporting wife character that's very sort of limited and, and unsure and makes her more of a, a, a real person with wants and needs and desires and feels human. You know, there's many times at the movie where you go, why is this person with Jeff Bridges' character? It, it makes no sense. So what Rule has to do is convince us in those limited scenes and, and make us understand why she is with, with this guy in, in this film because of the sort of intense love, the almost inexplicable love that she has for him. And she's the type of person, and we understand this through Rule's acting, that doesn't want to wait, that doesn't want to sort of let things fade out that they'll have this sort of hard cutoff if that's the case um, or, or, you know, instead of just sort of limping across the finish line at the end. And she's very bold and, and almost over the top in the film, but because within the context of their relationship, it's maybe not life and death, but to her, this means a lot and this is a sense of importance. So she almost transcends that sort of nagging element that you would see in maybe another kind of boring wife character and adds it into, by actually heightening her performance, adds to a sense of real urgency, real importance, that this is something that is important to her, that she's not going to push it away, that she is going to confront this sort of decaying relationship now and, and whether or not his character, Jeff Bridges' character, really loves her and, and to have that sort of confrontation. So she's, she could be funny in the movie, but I think the, the most impactful moments of her, her performance are sort of these sort of intense heartbreak and emotion and intense love that she communicates to the audience that she has for Jeff Bridges' character, which helps us understand why she keeps pulling him back and trying to refocus him to his overall goal. So it's not somebody that's taking our characters away from the main storyline, we're taking a sort of a slight detour out of the main storyline to help us understand and, and give our, our main character more of a sort of moral understanding and more of stakes to ultimately reach his goal. So she very works very well there in, in a supporting role. So super solid, just not unfortunately a lot in the movie. Um, so it doesn't get a lot of opportunities to showcase that, but in those scenes that she has, she's very good in it. So it will go into the B tier. Then the 1992 winner, Marissa Tomei from My Cousin Vinny. Another big, bold performance like Mercedes Rule. Uh, but what's interesting about this performance is my understanding of it growing up was always one that was a bit of an Oscar disappointment, a bit of a worst Oscar winner of all time. I think that reputation, because it was a bit of a surprise one at the time, I think the reputation was, oh, I can't believe this sort of high concept, very silly lawyer movie won an Oscar and kind of a ridiculous kind of a performance. But then I think in modern day understanding of the performance because of how well it played on cable and, and what have you, it's a really engaging, great comedic performance that I think is a beloved performance at this moment. And that's the way I think of it. That's the way I sort of understood it. And I've always enjoyed the movie. And Marissa Tomei, yes, it's over the top. Yes, it's big and grand. But I think she does a lot of great uh, elements and nails a lot of elements within the movie that give it a great performance element, a great performance sort of style. She really is the, the co-lead of the movie, so she gets to be in, in a lot of the movie, which, as we've talked about before, that just makes me like the movie more because, or the performance more, because I get more of her. She gets to showcase more of her acting style, which is great here is to create a, a strong romantic relationship with Joe Pesci and also uh, nail the, the comedic elements of the film. Despite the, the huge age difference, I mean, Pesci being 50 at the time and, and Tomei being 28, there is a real sense of romantic relationship and a connection that these two are meant to be together. And I think the way Tomei captures that is by matching the dialogue of Pesci. There's great back and forth, great chemistry that they have. And that's just because when Pesci's you know, giving his you know, line of dialogue, Tomei's right there to follow up. As soon as he's done talking, she's ready to go as well. Something that you, you can see oftentimes in 40s screwball comedy. It's that sort of quick back and forth, rapid pace of dialogue. Tomei matches the rhythm of, of, of Pesci's kind of unique way of speaking 
in a perfect way, that I think establishes a, a strong romantic relationship, that they've been together, that they know each other, that they can finish each other's sentences. This is a, a smart sort of decision there to match the rhythm, which I think adds to the romantic connection between the two. And then of course the very sort of comedic elements. This is a huge kind of a broad movie, very much a fish out of water story, and Tomei leans into that. She is, has a total commitment to the character. There is no winking, there is no meta element. She is this sort of very sort of sassy, funny, uh, uh, almost, um, uh, princess-like uh, woman from you know, New York having to be placed here in, in Alabama and she doesn't try to hide that she's very uh, bold in her personality and knows herself and not going to change that for anyone else and I think that creates an endearing quality because of how to make go so over the top she goes, you know very broad with her line deliveries and her behavior that it becomes in many ways charming and redeeming because there's a sense of authenticity because this person's not going to change for just because he's in Alabama and, and for other people. So exaggerated performance no doubt but very funny and to me that uh, is, is very memorable. So for me I'm going to put this one in the S tier. Then the 1993 winner Ann Pacman for The Piano. Now I'll be brief on this movie because we already discussed it on the 90s uh, lead actress T ranking video because Holly Hunter won for this film and while I wasn't in love with Holly Hunter's character I did really enjoy Anna Paquin in the film probably be because she is the sort of voice of the film being the one that speaks and it's a great performance but it's a great performance in part because she's a kid. I know she's going up against adults at the Oscars, but I kind of have to grade on a curve here because the same reason why the Academy gave her an Oscar, the amazement that a kid can do this, is the same amazement that I had watching the movie for the first time. Of course, I knew Anna Paquin from modern day roles that she's had throughout the years, but seeing her in her first role as, as a young child was very impressive because of how much she understands her role within the movie. I mean, she can be sort of slightly comedic and, and dry and sarcastic with some of her wit, which helps, I think, a lot of alleviate some of the seriousness that plagues so much of the film. She can be at least a little bit funny. But also, there's certain moments when, like children, when they cry, any sort of sense of conflict or intensity, she captures that unique emotion as well and helps us remind us that, oh, right, she is a kid. So she can do the comedy stuff, but she can also be very sad and, and heartbreaking as well. And ultimately, you know, we're grading on a curve because it's just a, a solid performance, but it's a solid performance done by a kid, which makes it even more impressive in my mind. So she was probably my favorite part of the film. So for me, it will go into the B tier. Then the 1994 winner, Diane Weist for Bullets Over Broadway, her second supporting actress Oscar win, second one for Woody Allen uh, movie. He's pretty great at this. He's had four supporting actress winners and two best lead actress winners for his movies. And he's great at that, great at writing these great female um, character parts and the actors really end up nailing out of the park. And here it is no different. Diane Weist playing a sort of parody, I guess you would say, of the Broadway diva actress, the old Hollywood diva actress who thinks she's so great and is the top of the world and has a sort of theatrical um, life that sort of blends into her, her real life persona. She's very bold, she takes herself very seriously. I think I'd like the performance a little bit more if I knew exactly who she was directly parodying. Um, that being said, sort of by bringing to life the, the great Helen Sinclair, it's very, um, well served within the film, even if I do think it's a little bit one note, it's a little bit sort of traditional in that she's asked to be this grand, larger than life theatrical kind of diva actress, and she's very good at that, but there's no a lot, there's not a lot of emotional depth to that. Um, but kind of like how I thought of last week with another Woody Allen movie, uh, which is um, Penelope Cruz for Vicky Cristina Barcelona. That movie, she wasn't asked to do a lot. She was asked to do one thing, and she did a very good job at that. I think similarly here with Diane Weist, a little bit one-dimensional, but does a great job at parodying these Broadway divas of which you know she's she's very good at. So solid enough to put her in, in the B tier. Then the 1995 winner, Mira Sorvino for Mighty Aphrodite, another Woody Allen win, a supporting actress win in this category, but unfortunately one I struggle with. It's not a bad performance necessarily, but unfortunately this is my list and there's certain personal preferences towards this. And this is a very sort of divisive performance, I think, by design. This sort of bimbo, high-pitched voice, uh, 
dumb blonde is a, is, a, is a type and I think it's meant to divide people either you really like it or you don't for me it was a bit of a, a turn off I didn't enjoy it there are moments when it's charming and cute but most of the time it felt a little bit of a drag to the movie and she's almost at the cult lead of the movie it may have been worked better if she was a truly supporting actress and only had a few scenes but she constantly sort of returns in the film and she really is one of the main characters if not the, the co-lead in my mind of, of the movie so for me it got a little bit stale it got a little bit of one note particularly towards the end of the film and i just couldn't really stand that that high-pitched tim witted type it felt a little bit generic a little, a little bit too broad for my mind and therefore the comedy didn't work so much so the trick gets a little bit old by the end of it a little bit drawn out so for me the performance will go into the seat here then the 1996 winner, Juliette Binoche for The English Patient. We've talked about this movie already on the Best Picture Tier Ranking video for the 90s. I also did a full video on this movie for my Forgotten Oscar film series. So I'll be brief and just say Juliette Binoche is my least part, favorite part of the movie. Not to say she is bad in the movie, but that she has a poor character. I think often because she's the one sort of explaining the more interesting storyline, she has to do a lot of exposition and carry that, which is a little bit you know emotionally distant and oftentimes because she's this person explaining the interesting storyline she's the person she's more of a, of a storytelling trope rather than an actual person that feels real so, and i always push back uh, against that and like i said it's not to say that Benoche is bad in the movie it's just that she has nothing to really to work with her relationship with naveen andrews is severely undercooked and there's no real romantic connection there just because we don't have many scenes to establish that it feels a little bit rushed and then our other scenes with Ray Fiennes, who's bandaged up in this version, he gives nothing in terms of facial performance because he, he's completely bandaged up. So it seems like her performance feels a little bit flat as a result because she's not acting across really anything, which which is difficult on, on her end, I'm sure. But just leads sort of a forgettable, flat, one-dimensional character and performance that um, wasn't really my cup of tea. So unfortunately, it will go into the C tier. Then the 1997 winner, Kim Bassinger for L.A. Confidential. And I decided to rewatch this movie. I'd seen it before a couple times. I decided to rewatch the movie in anticipation for this episode because I was trying to remember what exactly were her most notable moments. Why don't I remember her too, too much? And unfortunately, on the rewatch, it sort of just solidified my thoughts of, oh yeah, there's a reason why I couldn't think of memorable moments from the film with her character because there isn't really one. And I think the character really does passenger in disservice here because you have a character that we're told is more than just a prostitute we're told it's a woman with an interesting backstory and a life and yet every time she's used within the movie she's used in a sexual manner she's used as having sex with russell crowe's character or with guy pierce's character so we're told one thing we're told that she has a more eternal life but yet really the only appeal of her and the only use of her in the movie is to look like veronica lake and you know for a visual you know, credit. She does look like Veronica Lake. She is very well suited in the sort of femme fatale noir kind of trope where she's very angelic and pure within this swamp town. That being said, she doesn't get a lot to do outside of, of, of having sex with some of the main characters and just doesn't give Passenger a lot to work with. So she looks the part, uh, but she doesn't uh, do a she isn't really allowed to do a whole lot with it to give an interesting performance in, in my mind. So for me, it will go into the C tier. Then the 1998 winner, Judy Dench for Shakespeare in Love, and legendary performance at this point because it's one of the Oscar wins of all time with the lowest amount of screen time just above um, Beatrice Strait in Network, which we'll talk about a couple weeks from now. She's only in the movie for eight minutes, and she's relatively good being... Um, graceful and queen-like but she's in the movie for eight minutes this is a 120 minute movie she's barely in the movie she's totally forgettable in my mind she makes no imprint and impact on it so let's be honest for what this was this was an opportunity to give judy dench an oscar because the academy really liked shakespeare in love and they really want really liked judy dench and wanted to give her an oscar but uh, this performance is nothing at all there's nothing there it's eight minutes within 120 minutes of screen time nothing related to give Judy Dench to work with or to me to say is an interesting performance. So there's just not enough of it, unfortunately. So for me, it will go into the D tier. Then the 1999 winner, Angelina Jolie for Girl Interrupted. 
finally, a, a good performance. We had a streak there of some, some bad performances in a row for this category, but Jolie was a true breakout kind of a performance. Arguably, a performance that killed Winona Ryder's career because when you see them go head to head in the movie, you just go, oh, that's the sort of interesting young one that's going to break out. She's the one that is sort of the next big thing. And she was and, and had an interesting career, a career which I talked about on a series I did last year called Movie Star Magic. So if you want to hear four or five minutes of me talking about this movie in particular, I talked about it in that episode and the career of, of Jolie and her arc, a really fascinating movie star career. But just sort of reiterate what I talked about in that video, I think she has a strong sort of live wire energy within the film. There is this sort of danger that she brings. Of course, her character is supposed to be that as well, but Jolie actually brings the energy uh, and the sort of jitteriness, that nervousness, these, the I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know what she's going to say. Kind of a fascination that you have with her character. Jolie, I think, brings out that energy through her sort of conniving uh, ways of, of and sharp insults in terms of her delivering the dialogue, but also in terms of just how, we care, how she carries herself and the confidence that she has. Roger Ebert wrote in the review for Girl Interrupted that she is a loose cannon with deadly aim, and I think that's the best way to describe Jolie's performance in this film. So we'll leave it at that and say this is a great uh, debut type performance that will go into the A tier. But that's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you comment below. Let me know your personal tier rankings for this. Is it similar with my list? Is it not? Do, was it a little bit too harsh on some of the actresses there in the 90s? Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. But that's about it. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And until next time, stay tuned.